Thank you for joining us for church today as we enter week three of our series, Women of God. I have a couple important things I want to share with you so you can stay up to date with what is happening here at Point Church. First, I would like to invite you to check out our Discover class happening on June the 6th. This is a great opportunity to get to know us, ask questions, and take next steps. Food and childcare are available. If you're interested, just check on your Connect card for more information. Second, we are about to begin our summer session of Rooted on June 6th. Don't know what Rooted is? Rooted is a 10-week discipleship experience for people in every stage of life and in their faith journey. Discussions are held in small groups of 10 to 15 people. Together, we explore the Bible, engage in experiences, share stories, and practice rhythms essential to living a healthy spiritual life. Rooted starts on June the 6th. So go to pointchurch.com slash rooted today to find out more and to let us know you're interested. Lastly, serving sacrificially is one of our core values. One of the ways we do that is through our Care Center. Starting today, we are hosting our first annual Point Care Center raffle to help support our care centers. This drawing will help us with our equipment needs, purchase extra food, and financial assistance for those who need it. We are raffling away a cabin we can get away, spa baskets, and gifts from local businesses. The raffle is open until June the 11th, so go to pointcarecenter.com or our Point Care Center Facebook page to see all the prizes and purchase a ticket. Thank you for supporting our Point Care Centers. Now, let's get ready for today's service. Hello everyone, my name is Whitney, and I want to welcome you to Church Online. Regardless of where you're watching from today, whether you're at a microsite, on Facebook, or on YouTube, I am so glad you're here. I'd love for you to take a second and share today's service on social media. You never know who might join in because you made a digital invitation. And over the next few moments, I want to encourage you to move beyond simply watching. Sing with us, open the scriptures, and read them with us, and take communion with us. Let's experience church together today. Now let's jump into the music with Bryce and the team, and I'll see you again in a few minutes. Welcome to Church Online. Come on, why don't you sing with us? I was buried beneath my shame. Who could care? Too high. 
sing this with us? Sing, I needed rescue. I needed rescue. My sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broke. I want to say thank you to everyone who partners with us through giving here on Church Online. Your generosity is put to work immediately to help us serve others, meet real needs, and point people to Jesus. As a church, we partner with Carolina Movement, an organization all about helping planting churches. Our team had the opportunity to put on a retreat this past weekend for over 50 pastors and church planners to inspire, teach, and refuel them. Carolina Movement is also helping plant two new churches this fall that we cannot wait to see God's work through. And your generosity plays a big part in that. So if you consider Church Online your church home, or if you would like to begin giving, we've made it very easy. All you have to do is go to pointchurch.com give, or you can grab your smartphone and text Point Church and a dollar amount to 77977. When you give, simply select Church Online option. Now grab your Bible, your iPhone, your iPad, however it is that you open the scriptures and find the New Testament book of John. If you don't have a physical Bible with you, we're going to post a link in the chat section and the video description to a great Bible app. You can download it and that way you'll always have the scriptures with you wherever you go. And let's get ready for today's message. When you think of classic movie monsters, you might picture Dracula, Frankenstein, or even the mummy. But one of the oldest monsters in film, or history for that matter, is the zombie. Some archaeologists suggest that the earliest evidence for belief in the undead was found in the ancient Greeks. But zombie folklore has been around for centuries, even in modern history. It's typically associated with voodoo practices in parts of Africa, Brazil, Haiti, and even the American South. Now, usually zombies are portrayed as undead, flesh-eating, decaying corpses and have enjoyed a popularity surge in recent years. Whether they're devouring their prey in The Walking Dead or the recently released Army of the Dead, zombies dominate pop culture. These undead creatures are either a reawakened corpse or they're someone bitten by another zombie infected with some sort of zombie virus. They tend to be strong, mindless, and robotic. Now, the earliest mention of zombies in literature goes as far back as 1697, though it wasn't until about 1932, over 200 years later, that they made their debut in film. But then finally, in 1968, zombies acquired a cult following with the release of the movie Night of the Living Dead. From the 1980s on, dozens of zombie movies were filmed, even in children's shows like Scooby-Doo. So for the monster lover out there, this has been like a fun history lesson. But for the rest of you, you're probably wondering, what on earth does this have to do with the Bible? And that is an excellent question. You see, zombies, as we said, are robotic, single-minded creatures that live for nothing else but to satisfy their own appetites. In doing so, they wander the earth until they're either killed or else naturally decay. That doesn't sound too different from the way that many people live their lives today, does it? The Christian rapper Lecrae wrote a song about this called What Else But Zombie. If you have Spotify or Apple Music or even YouTube, go and check that out. Zombie by Lecrae, you won't be disappointed. But instead of chasing meaningless appetites, we're called to die to our old life and instead pursue a new one, one with meaning and purpose. 
Like, I'll, I'll show you what I mean. Turn with me to Romans chapter 12. But before we dive into that, we need to consider the context. As with anything, you can't just jump into the middle of something and expect to, to understand the whole movie. So there are 11 chapters of context in Paul's letter before chapter 12 that we need to look at first. So what's the context? Well, there was a community of believers in the city of Rome composed of two different groups of people. Jews turned Christians and pagans turned Christians. And they had a bit of a beef with one another. So Paul lays out the foundations of the gospel to show them the unity they have in Christ, that, that we have all sinned and fallen short of God's design for our lives. Instead of flourishing and enjoying God's presence, we turned against him, living selfishly, harming others, and experiencing brokenness. We needed a rescuer. And so in his love, God came down as a man to take our punishment so that we could receive forgiveness. It's from this vantage point in chapter 12 that Paul shows us how this good news is to be lived out in everyday life. So now that we're called up, let's take a quick moment to look at Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Paul says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. There are two things that I want you to take away from this passage, and the first feeds into the second. The first thing that we're called to do is worship with your life. Worship with your life. Why? Because a full life is a life of worship. But for some of you, worship might be a strange word. You might picture people bowing down at a temple, singing songs in a religious gathering or, or something else. But worship is so much more. So what do I mean by worship? Well, Herbert Carson, a pastor in the 20th century, said, To worship God is to realize the purpose for which God created us. God created you, your strengths, weaknesses, quirks, and oddities for a reason. When you live out your potential for the glory of God, you are worshiping. Whether you're a plumber, a stay-at-home parent, a student, or a college professor, your life can be an act of worship. It's not just reserved for Sunday mornings. That's what it means to be a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice is a person who directs every thought or action to the glory of God. In the Old Testament, priests would sacrifice an animal on behalf of the people of Israel as payment for their sins and as an act of worship. But God wasn't really concerned about their sacrifices. He was more interested in the hearts of those doing the sacrificing. Scripture says, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice. God was more interested in their hearts than their sacrifice. God wants our thoughts, affections, and behaviors to be pointed toward him. It's, it's not about checking off a to-do list or creating better habits so that God will be proud of you. That's just worldly religion, and it doesn't honor the Lord. Living a life of worship means living into our purpose through a loving relationship with Jesus. If you're a singer, sing to the glory of God. If you're a math teacher, teach to the glory of God. If you scrub toilets for a living, then clean that toilet as if God himself were to use it. Now, from time to time, you might feel like you're just trying to appease God, right? You know, I'll read my Bible so I won't feel guilty. But that's an unhealthy motivation, and it will soon lead to burnout and apathy. Instead, Paul urges us to be motivated by the mercies of God. Notice the order of verse 1. Paul doesn't start by saying, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Instead, he begins with the phrase, in view of God's mercy. When we remember just what Jesus did for us on the cross, how he was punished for our guilt, we should be motivated by his crazy act of love to live for him. If you feel yourself slipping into a workspace relationship with God rather than one founded on love, take a moment in the morning or, or before you go to bed to meditate on God's mercies in your life. Make a gratitude list uh, or simply reread the story of the crucifixion. And don't be afraid to ask him straight up, Ask God to recapture your mind. Ask him to stoke the embers of your heart. Part of the Christian walk is learning to add fuel to the fire of our heart. As a community of believers, it is our job to stoke the embers of our souls and remind one another of the beauty of the cross. It's much easier to live a life of worship when we are motivated by the love of God 
rather than by shame, guilt, or fear. Now, if we are committed to living a life of worship, how do we do that? When our lives change as fast as they do, how do we make sure that we are on the right track? Well, thankfully, Paul doesn't leave us hanging. In verse 2, he says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. To keep ourselves heading in the right direction, Paul says, devote yourself to personal renewal. Devote yourself to personal renewal. S scripture is clear that the world should never serve as our role model for living a moral, God-honoring life. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't celebrate what society does right, but we should do so in line with God's design. To conform to this world's standards is to put our walk with God in jeopardy. However, the answer isn't to avoid the world and become a hermit. Rather, it's to live counterculturally, to live as a citizen of heaven while here on earth. And that citizenship comes with new values and a new identity. And so to avoid the trappings of the world around us, our minds need to constantly be renewed. The Greek word for mind is the word naos. And in Greek culture, the mind was the control center of one's attitudes, thoughts, feelings, and actions. So Paul's saying that as believers, we should be transformed by the renewing of our entire character. As we're transformed and renewed, we come to desire God's will for our lives. Another way of saying this is to say, when you are transformed in Christ, you love to do what you ought to do. So while there are some practical ways that we can renew ourselves, and we'll talk about that in a second, it's important to remember that it's ultimately not up to us. It's, it's, it's not up to another to-do list that we have to do. Pastor John Piper said the Christian alternative to immoral behaviors is not a new list of moral behaviors. It is the triumphant power and transformation of the Holy Spirit through faith in Jesus Christ. Our behaviors are an outworking of what the Holy Spirit is doing in us. And contrary to popular belief, renewal isn't about simply obtaining more knowledge. I mean, I love to learn. I love education. But that's not the answer to true, lasting transformation. If you and I are sinful and we get more educated, what happens? We just discover more intelligent ways to sin. I mean, how else would people invent elaborate scams, complex schemes for embezzling, and coordinate sophisticated terrorist plots? Again, Piper says that the problem with our minds is not that they are finite, but that they are fallen. That's why the Holy Spirit must be involved or renewal won't happen. It can't happen. He is the primary mover. God is the, the mover in our souls. Now, but what can we do, right? So what, what can we do on our end? Uh, what can we do to help the process along? God works most often through ordinary spiritual rhythms established in the Bible. It's really not rocket science. We can experience renewal through Christian community, Bible study, prayer, evangelism, confession, and, and so on. Now, here at Point Church, we try to help you along this process with our Next Steps pathway. In this pathway, we encourage everyone to experience God in a worship service, connect with others in a life group, serve with others in a serve group, grow in a core group, and then begin to lead others to do the same. But regardless of how it's done, as we renew our minds, Paul says that the result will be the ability to discern God's good, pleasing, and perfect will. If you're interested in learning more about what the Bible has to say on spiritual, personal growth, I recommend reading one of these two books. The first is The Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster, or you can read The Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life by Donald Whitney. Both of those are, are great books. But as with any discipline, if we're not motivated by the right desires, if we don't have in view God's mercy, pursuing spiritual rhythms can feel frustrating, dry, and boring. If we don't have the right attitude and goals, we can end up just looking like the Pharisees who looked good on the outside, but were far from God on the inside. You see, Jesus isn't looking for spiritual robots, actors, or pretenders. He wants our hearts. You know, my, my wife, Rachel, used to love listening to true crime podcasts. It was her obsession for a couple of years. I mean, when I'd come home from work, she either had her headphones in listening to some crime story or a documentary playing on the TV. I mean, it was, it was constant. And so one day, I remember on a long car ride home from visiting her parents, we decided to listen to one of her podcasts together. And the story told went 
something like this. In Florida, a 17-year-old boy by the name of Malachi Robinson snuck into a hospital and he stole a white lab coat. And from there, he went on to pose as a resident doctor. He walked around the hospital visiting patients and, and viewing surgeries. And whenever he was asked what he was doing, he always said, oh, I'm, I'm uh, shadowing the doctor for the day. But he spoke with such confidence that everyone believed him. I mean, nobody doubted that he was there to shadow a doctor. Uh, he did this for about a month until he was eventually called, but because he was 17 years old, he was basically let off with a, uh, with a warning, a little slap on the hand. However, several months later, Malachi began posing as a doctor again, and this time as a homeopathic or holistic doctor. He opened up a very official looking office in Florida and bought a bunch of uh, medical equipment for, from investors that he had lied to and was then all set to begin practicing medicine without any training. In fact, he even went to an elderly woman's home who was suffering from intestinal pain. And because her regular doctors couldn't figure out a cure to her pain, she turned to Malachi. When Malachi arrived at her home, he began to examine the woman as, as any normal good doctor would. He even told the woman that he could cure her ailments and she believed him. So Malachi gave her a high dosage of over-the-counter sleeping vitamins. As you can guess, it didn't work. As anyone can predict, the, the vitamins just made things worse and the woman ended up in the hospital with severe pain. And so after the distant, or after the incident, Malachi simply faded away into the background, but eventually the police caught up with him. They caught up with this smooth talking young man and arrested him. And now because he was 18 years old, he was charged as an adult and sentenced to many years in prison. So I, I bring up this weird story because just like Malachi, we can go through the motions in our spiritual lives. Just like Malachi pretended to be a doctor, we can fool ourselves into thinking that if we say the right words and check the right boxes, God will be happy with us. But God doesn't want people to just go through the motions. That's what the Pharisees did. And again, Jesus called them whitewashed tombs, clean on the outside, filthy on the inside. Instead, with humility, we can genuinely pursue Jesus because there's no one who loves you more or wants better for you than God himself. In light of this, I challenge you to pursue Jesus daily. Listen to rich sermons from respected preachers. Read your Bible from cover to cover, always in search of God's heart. Find a man or a woman of God to mentor you in the faith. And in all of it, pray, pray, pray that the Holy Spirit would renew your mind so that you may desire the will of God, so that all of life will become worship. In Matthew 6, Jesus says this, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. If we pursue Jesus with everything that we have, God will take care of us, not only our physical needs, but our spiritual ones as well. If you haven't taken that step to find forgiveness in Jesus and experience the new life he offers, there's no better time to start than right now. Don't be a zombie. Die to your old life so that you may find a new one with meaning, purpose, and joy. In a poem by Kate Wilkinson, she writes, May the mind of Christ, my Savior, live in me from day to day, by his love and power controlling all I do and say. May the word of God dwell richly in my heart from hour to hour, so that all may see I triumph only through his power. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your goodness to us. Lord, we thank you for your mercies. Father, whenever the enemy tries to dissuade us and convince us that they're not important. Lord, that, that, that your crucifixion, that your sacrifice, that your love for us is something ordinary. Father, may you remind of, uh, us of how extraordinary it really is. Lord, may you fill us with your spirit and lead us to become more like Christ. We love you, Lord, and we pray these things for your glory and our good. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love. Jesus.
As we come to this time of communion, feel free to pause the video and grab whatever bread and juice or other liquid that you have available. 
As we try to meditate and remember the mercies of God, there's no better way to do that than with communion. You see, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he sat with his disciples and he took a piece of bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body broken for you. As often as you do this, do so in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread. He also held up a cup and he said, this represents the new covenant in my blood. As often as we take this, we do so remembering what Christ did for us and the blood that was shed on the cross. Let's take and drink together. May you remember the goodness and the great love that God has shown for you all those years ago on the cross and even today in this very moment. Thanks. Thank you for spending some time with us today. Before you go, we have two things we'd love for you to do. First, each week we create a discussion guide that goes along with the Church Online message. The discussion guide will help you dig a little deeper into each week's topic and provide some helpful tips to apply what you've learned. You can find that guide right now in the video description below or immediately following the service. You'll see questions pop up and you can pause the video and think about how you would answer each question. And second, we believe that following Jesus is best done in community with others. So consider inviting someone, a friend, a family member, or a neighbor to watch church online with you next week. God bless you, we love you, and we'll see you again soon.